reiterate some of the unique properties of gold because this is really critical in terms of how you explore for it. Due to the value of gold, mineral deposits that contain as little as 200 parts per billion <coughs> could be economic to mine, particularly when they're found in association with other metals like copper. So um, gold deposits by themselves can be economically mined when they contain as little as half a ppm, 0.5 of one part per million. <coughs> and many gold mines have no more than 10 or th even 30. 30 parts per million is a fairly high grade gold mine. So that's 30 parts per million. So <coughs> on top of that, you've got um, as well as the fact that you've got very small concentrations of gold in the, in the rock, in nature, you get some very large crystals of gold forming. You've seen the pictures of the, the rocks in the previous slide, and you can see a picture there which shows uh, gold grains from a particular deposit, and it shows you the size of them. And some of those individual gold flakes and grains can be you know, two, three centimetres. And so you only need one of those in probably a hundred tons of rock to be have a very economic mine, very profitable mine. So 99.999% of that hundred tons has got nothing and you just have one of those grains and you can make good money. This is a, a range of pictures showing you what you would see if you had different levels of uh, concentration. So the bottom right hand side there you've got little um, circles there would show if you had something that was 50% and one of the common minerals that we mine and explore for and, and process that we do mine at 50% is iron. So if you're mining an iron ore mine, if you have an iron ore mine, you often have grades of iron of 50% or more. So what you see in that bottom right hand, those two slides, uh, the two circles in the bottom right hand side, is what you would expect to see if you picked up a sample and there was 50% of whatever it is you're looking for in that. And so those circles show you gradations all the way down to 1%. And so if you had something that was 1%, that's what you would see if you picked up a sample. And we mine many, many commodities at 1%. Copper is a really good example of a, a commodity that might be 1% in the rock that we make, again, we make good money out of and, and process. The bottom shows you the transition from 1% down to the levels that we're now at at gold. So underneath that you've got, so you've got 1% equals 10,000 parts per million. That's the conversion of 1% to 10,000 parts per million. So if you have a deposit of gold that is 1%, then I know you're not going to be here because you're going to be, be you put, you'll probably own Singapore if you had a deposit that uh, was that rich because there are no gold deposits that rich because the average grade is 10,000 parts per million in that deposit. If you divide that by 10, you're now down at 0.1%, which is 1,000 parts per million. There are no, there are virtually no gold mines operating at 1,000 parts per million. Occasionally you'll get samples at 1,000 parts per million, but the production over a year is not 1,000 parts per million. Take another 10% of that and you're at 0.01%, which is 100 parts per million. There's virtually no mines in the world that are operating at an average grade of 100 parts per million. There's a couple. Take another 10% and you're now down at 0.001%, which is 10 parts per million. Now there are quite a lot of mines operating at 10 parts per million. There are also quite a lot of gold mines operating profitably at one part per million. And that's the only thing they produce, gold, at one part per million. And then in terms of an exploration, you want, to, you want to be able to determine if you've got things at, at 100 parts per billion because that tells geologists that there's something anomalous. They've got elevations of gold at that level which could be indicative of that you're near a gold deposit with high levels. So we need to be able to see and 
define and, and take samples where we're getting grades from the laboratory back at even less than 100 parts per billion. Often, we're down at one or two parts per billion in terms of samples for analysis that go to laboratories. So think about that. So now we're looking at the gold content represented by one part per billion, part per million. Can you see that? <laughs> Surely you can see that. <laughs> and that's part of the problem and the challenge we deal with. Okay, because no one can see one part per million. But one part per million is economically viable in terms of the gold content of the mine. That table there is showing you how many deposits have been identified that have more than 10 million ounces of gold in them. And so you can see there that the orogenic deposits, there's, there's at least 20 of those have been found around the world with more than 10 million ounces of gold. And uh, the reduced models is 13, the oxidized models is 39, and, and the other types there is uh, up around uh, over 20. So in each of those models, there are some very, very large gold deposits. Okay. There's also, for every one of those models, there's many, many more smaller gold deposits. And this is really important when it comes to investing in the gold uh, industry. So if you're looking for gold, it's a good place to start. Think about how gold is formed. Look at where gold is being explored for, where it's being mined, where it's been found previously, and you know, it's a good, good place to start. In terms of some of the work that you would do in regional exploration, what, what you want to do is do some <coughs> literature research, and, and you'll want to try to understand how much free geological information can I get from the government in the country that you're looking for. And a lot of governments supply a lot of information to start with. So you do your homework. You try to read and find everything you can find about the, the regional geology in your area and um, <coughs> collate all of that, integrated, and, and then start your exploration. And your exploration might be including satellite imagery, air, air photo imagery, a whole range of different things that could give you some indication of, of what's going on underground. And in this case, you've got an example of a, a radiometrics image. And a radiometrics is a very particular sensing uh, technology, but it really only looks at the surface of the earth. So if you've got soil, it's really only giving you an indication of what's in the soil. You might have magnetics, which is, a, is sensing the magnetic uh, strength of the rocks, and that could, could potentially look down five kilometers into the earth's surface. It's only going to tell you something about the magnetic properties of the rocks, which are totally unrelated to gold. But it's giving you some information about the rocks themselves. And if you look at the gravity response, which is another geophysical response, then that has the potential of looking down 10 kilometers into the Earth's surface. So all of the, this information, you're trying to get to form a picture of what's happening under the, under the ground in your area. You're going to start to do, so, so somewhere along the, time, along the line in your property, you need to do some real work. You need to collect some samples to get an understanding of what's on your property. And stream sediment geochemistry is, is a very common way of companies getting uh, relatively cheap samples from streams which provide information on the catchments up in behind the stream level. So um, you can see a couple of pictures there of people collecting stream sediment samples. And they're used for reconnaissance and, and to try to, to, to get a feel for the, the regional content of gold and many other uh, elements in terms of the catchments within the streams. Where you don't have a lot of streams, and, and Australia is a very good example of this, you even can collect samples of the um, plant species. And you can see a picture there of the, on the right-hand side of Spinifex, and you can see the root structure there. Spinifex is known to actually be able to attract and, and draw into its structure gold. So by collecting particular samples of the vegetation, you can look for gold anomalies. Now, here we're talking down at the parts per billion level. So a lot of this technology is quite recent because 
um, chemistry wasn't really able to give us analytical results with any degree of accuracy down at one part per billion until the last 20 years. So we just could not do this previously. But now this is something that many companies will actually do to start to try to see, do I have any elevated areas of gold that might give me an indication of something underground? We do lots of soil geochemistry as well. So lot, collecting samples, you can see here a, a small pit that's been collected and, and we're taking samples of the soil sending them to the laboratory, getting them analysed for generally lots of different elements. So um, you know, sometimes you would be um, looking for a gold anomaly in that soil, but often you're looking for pathfinder elements, elements that are accompanying the gold that you have more of a chance of finding uh, higher levels for. So sometimes it could be things like arsenic, copper, or various other elements that you're looking as to that accompany the gold sometimes. And what you'll be doing in that instance is you'll be generating um, maps and plans, looking for elevations of various elements that you can then go and test in a more detailed fashion. So it's a, it's a process. You also, in places where you do have rocks on the surface, you can see um, here people collecting rock chip samples, sending them to uh, laboratories for analysis. Ultimately, you need to do lots of drilling to test for gold deposits. And drilling um, it provides you with geological information, it provides you with geochemical information, and that's what you use to really discover and define gold deposits as well as most other deposits. It can be really expensive, and in some places around the world it can cost you $500 Australian or Singapore or more per metre to drill a hole. Now, often it's you know two or three hundred dollars depending on the, the methodology but um, some of the cheaper drilling methods you can probably get down to as low as fifteen dollars a meter but when you think about some of the companies that uh, might be drilling they might be drilling you know thirty forty thousand meters in a year that's an expensive exercise when you're starting to drill but it's really the only way to define the tonnage and the grade of the gold that you have uh, the type of drilling that we can do is the rotary air blast, um, which is grab RC, which is reverse circulation, and, and diamond. And for gold, many people rely on diamond drilling, and that's the most expensive method to do that. And this is an example just where you can see here the, the red zones in the pictures. Uh, they don't really look red to you, but they look, they look black, I suppose. That's the, you know, the interpretation of what's where the gold deposit is, and you can see some uh, angled lines coming down from the, the surface, which are, are drill holes that are uh, intersecting that. So those drill holes have been completed to test the, the extent of the gold mineralization below the surface and allow us to estimate how many tons of gold we've got, or how many tons of gold bearing uh, minerals we have, and the grade of that material. And at the end of all of that process, you, you try to form an understanding of the size, the extent, the geometry of a gold deposit. And this is a, a, a quite a large deposit in, in uh, Australia, Canal and Bell. And it shows you there that uh, you've got uh, a surface area which uh, that pale, pinky, um, browny colour is the, is the open pit. But the deposit itself is, is the white zone and it goes down for a, um, you know, a couple of kilometres. And, and that's the, the definition of that is all through drilling. Uh, and so that's what you know, geologists spend most of their time doing is, is once you explore, once you find something, you spend a substantial amount of time defining the extents of an ore body, defining the grade, defining the tons, and provide that information to the mining engineers and the metallurgists <coughs> to allow them then to design systems to mine and extract and process and, and actually sell the, the gold that's produced. In the survey results for 2012, 740 companies contributed to that survey and those companies were respons responsible for exploration expenditure of $6.2 billion in 2012. So it's a pretty good survey in terms of how comprehensive it is. And from that survey, 
it identified that 49% of the expenditure of the survey recipients was directed at gold. Okay. So it was by far the biggest area of gold, uh, of expenditure is, is the gold. And of the survey recipients, so, so 300, obviously that's 304 of those, um, you know, 49% of the, the survey recipients, their key focus was gold. And the next level down was, was copper. Now, often gold is associated with copper, so if you're exploring for copper, you'll pick up the gold as well. But the 49% the there is really saying that gold is our key focus in terms of exploration. So you can see that there that gold is a major, major target for many companies exploring around the world. And the key destinations for that exploration in 2012, you can see there that uh, this is non-ferrous, um, which includes a lot of other metals, but as we just said, half of the focus is just on gold. So this is pretty representative of where a lot of the gold exploration dollars that are being spent on exploration are directed. You can see there Canada and Australia are, are two key targets, and uh, you've got lots of Latin America, lots of Africa, and, and other places there as well. <coughs> 